Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Among his many interests, I think that it's fairly well known that King Henry VIII was very keen on listening to, playing and composing music. While he almost certainly didn't write the famous green sleeves that is most commonly attributed to him, many of his compositions do survive. Personally, I rather like his pastime with good company. I think it's an upbeat and fun song. Now, I've chosen at the start of the video to draw attention to Henry's own engagement with and interest in music to point to just how fine of a line the individual we are going to be focusing on today must have walked at the very start of his career and indeed beyond that point. Because he was a composer of choral religious music who was working during first the Henrician Reformation and then the Edwardian Reformation. After that, he continued on through the Marian Counter-Reformation and indeed on to the reversal of that Counter-Reformation which occurred during the reign of Elizabeth I. The fact that he was able not only to survive but to succeed is, I would argue, a testament to him as an individual. Today, we're talking about Thomas Tallis. Let's look at him. When it comes to Thomas Tallis's early years, we know next to nothing. Take the date range for his birth alone. That is around two decades wide. It ranges from 1500 to somewhere in the 1520s. With that being said, it has been suggested that it's most likely that he was born at the start of this period, and this is because one of his compositions does feature in a music manuscript that has been dated to the later 1520s, so presumably he must have been old enough to have produced a musical score by that point. This, in turn, has been used to support a date of birth for Thomas Tallis of around 1505, although some argue that even earlier than this makes more sense. We don't know who his parents were, where he was born, where he was raised or educated for his earliest years. He did have a relation who was recorded as living in Thanet, so it has been suggested that Tallis, like his relative, may also have had Kentish ties. John Harley points out that there were other Tallises registered in Canterbury, Elham and New Romney, all of which are in Kent. He uses this to support the idea that Tallis came from Kent too. Although we don't know where he trained, it has been supposed, based upon his later output, that he was, from the beginning, a chorister. It has been noted that this training would have given him a vast experience of the musicality of the faith practice in England in the early decades of the 1500s. In addition to training to be a chorister, Tallis would also have been schooled. His schooling would have included lessons in the Latin language, which he would later use in the lyrics of some of his musical compositions, particularly those that would have been produced during the periods where the use of Latin for faith music was a fashionable and, in certain instances, safe thing to do. As Tallis's training went on, he gained competency on the organ, and perhaps with a variety of other instruments too. The accounts from the Benedictine Priory of Dover tell us that by the early 1530s, Thomas Tallis was employed as the organ player there. Dover Priory was surrendered to the Crown in 1535, which makes it a fairly early victim of the dissolution of the monasteries. Between 1537 and 1538, Thomas Tallis features in the records of the large parish church of St Mary at Hill, which was in Billingsgate, London. There, he was employed as a chorister or, quote, a singing man of the choir. But it's possible that he also served as an organist there if he was required to do so. In 1538, he became a senior member of the choral performers at the Augustinian Abbey of Waltham Cross in Essex. When that abbey was dissolved in 1540, Tallis received a comparatively large payout of 40 shillings for, quote, wages and, quote, rewards. 
as there were 20 shillings to a pound, that represents a sum of two pounds for Talis altogether. In 1540s money, two pounds is roughly the equivalent of 842 pounds and 71 pence in 2017 money, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if we stay with the National Archives currency converter, we can see that that, in turn, is equivalent to 66 days of pay for a skilled tradesman. To further help matters, Tallis swiftly found new employment, this time at the head of the list of choristers for Canterbury Cathedral. Tallis would be working there when, on the 8th of April 1541, Canterbury was reconstituted to become one of the cathedrals of the so-called New Foundation. He remained in that post for a couple more years, before making his final professional move to become a member of the choir of the Chapel Royal. I think it's fair to say that Thomas Tallis's early career took place in the shadow of the Reformation. That within those formative years of his working life, a time when his preferences and style were being shaped, he must have been keenly aware of the risks, but also perhaps of the opportunities that were being presented every day by the shifting parameters of what was acceptable in the practice of faith in England. It is also, I believe, useful to point out that Despite the clearly religious nature of his employment, Thomas Tallis was not a member of any religious order, that he had taken no vows, that he was instead a layperson. And I wonder if we may want to ask ourselves whether this fact, the fact that Thomas Tallis was part of the laity, is something that contributed to his survival and ultimate success. Is it possible that his lack of sworn vows or clear faith affiliation allowed him to be perceived as a talented professional rather than a potential problem by the successive and ultimately divergent regimes that he served? When we discuss Tallis's creative output during these early years, John Milsom writes that, quote, The Marian Antiphon Salve Intimerata is his earliest work. Milsom describes it as being, quote, substantial and ornate, and states that it is one of, quote, very few works by Tallis that can be firmly attributed to these early years. As I have absolutely no desire to get into any trouble with regards to copyright, but as I also want to give all of you the opportunity to listen to the pieces I'm going to mention today in their entirety, if you so wish, I am going to be linking the ones that I talk about in this video in various places, wherever I think will be most useful and I can find a way to do. And I will be starting with Salway Intimerata. Now, there are certainly going to be lots of people, some of whom may even be watching right now, that will have a far better understanding of music, of composition, and of the development of an individual's musical style than I can either lay claim to or ever hope to achieve. So if that's you, please do add your insights on this particular topic in the live chat or the comments. All I can say, based upon the frankly limited musical knowledge that I have, is that Thomas Tallis composed pieces that I find truly mesmerising. My personal favourite is in fact one of his later works, Spem in Allium. It's a motet for 40 voices and we will be talking about it more later. To return to the Chapel Royal, Tallis is named as a, quote, gentleman of the chapel in a lay subsidy role of 1543-4. to four. He would continue in this post for a little more than 40 years. While Henry VIII and his heirs may have oscillated in matters of permissible faith practice, the Tudors did share at least one commonality, and it was one that I think made Tallis's life easier. Henry's love of music was a feature of both the secular and the spiritual life at his royal court. When it came to educating and enriching his children, music lessons ran through their learning. They would then follow on from their father and each other in maintaining and shaping an entertaining and cultured royal court that aspired to boast the best of absolutely everything, including musicians. And thus, Tallis would be surrounded throughout his career by esteemed colleagues and students individuals for him to make music alongside and to compose music for. The musicians of the Chapel Royal were, by rota, put to work on a daily basis. 
singing for the regular services that took place every day throughout the day in the liturgical calendar. However, in addition to this, their labours were also required at the more occasional and indeed grander moments of state. Times when displays of majesty were absolutely the order of the day. I'm talking about at the marriages of members of the royal family, at the baptisms of their babies, at their coronations and at their funerals. The chapel royal was a constant feature in the day-to-day -day worship and high ceremony of the Tudor monarchs. These musicians were in essence providing the soundtrack to monarchy. But as the music they made was religious in character, these people were going to need to be adaptable, especially as the Tudor era ran its course. I am about to massively oversimplify the various faith-based shifts of the 16th century in England because I think it's going to provide a useful insight into what Thomas Tallis and indeed his colleagues had to navigate in their time as gentlemen of the Chapel Royal. I'm not going to go into more detail about it because the Reformation is a separate video and we are here to talk about Tallis. So when Thomas Tallis joined the Chapel Royal in 1543, the act of supremacy which had asserted that Henry VIII was supreme head of the church in England was already more than a decade old. England was well and truly broken away from the authority of the Pope in Rome, the English Reformation was going full steam ahead. And I've often heard people say that through Henry VIII's Reformation, England became Protestant, that Henry became Protestant. This is, however, a mischaracterization. Because to my mind, Henry VIII was born a Roman Catholic. He would die an English Catholic. One whose designs for his tomb include an area where masses could be said for his soul. This was with the intention that his soul would spend little to no time in purgatory. The problem is that belief in the existence of purgatory and also in the efficacy of, quote, works such as the buying of masses for the soul are things that run absolutely counter to Protestant doctrinal shifts. Further to this, as Henry VIII's reign wound to a close, the so-called use of Sarum or Salisbury, which dated back to the 11th century, was still the liturgical form of worship that was being followed. These Latin rites maintained a continuity with pre-Reformation faith practices, and Tallis and his colleagues worked with this in mind. Milsom states that, quote, It was for this liturgy that Tallis initially wrote choral settings of hymns and office responsories, based on traditional plain chant melodies. Some have asserted that Thomas Tallis was in attendance, and thus, I assume, making music for King Henry VIII's funeral. When Henry's nine-year-old son succeeded him in 1547, to become King Edward VI, he and his Regency Council removed England from a variety of things, including the traditional musical expressions of faith. Tallis was said to have been at Edward VI's coronation, presumably once again making music for that. The 1549 publication of the Book of Common Prayer was a decisive moment in the shift of faith and faith music, because the form of worship, the liturgy, was being reformed and remade by this publication. And so now, Tallis and his fellow composers were being given a unique opportunity because suddenly a large collection of new faith music, hymns, chants and anthems that corresponded with this new liturgy had become a requirement. After Edward's death in 1553, and following the short-lived reign of his cousin and named successor Jane Grey, this boy king's eldest half-sister effectively asserted her own claim to the throne of England in order to become Queen Mary I. Again, it is said that Tallis was at this coronation too. From the very start of her reign, Mary set out to reverse the faith changes that had been made by both her brother and her father. She would seek and receive absolution from the Pope on behalf of her entire nation, and in so doing she returned England into obedience with Rome. Additionally, it was during Queen Mary I's reign, in or not long after 1554, that Thomas Tallis married. 
His wife, Joan, was the widow of one of his colleagues from the Chapel Royal, one Thomas Berry, who died in 1554. It is believed that this couple owned or perhaps rented a home in Greenwich, which is a location that's useful for its proximity to the royal palaces in which the Chapel Royal was serviced. There is no record of any children being born to this couple. W.H. Grattan Flood mentions a manor at Thanet that Mary I granted Talis the lease to, the rents from which would have added to the earnings that he received as a gentleman of the Chapel Royal. And perhaps we can read this as Mary being pleased with Talis's work, or perhaps with his faith, or at least with the way he presented his faith before her. I wonder, what do you think? Why was he so rewarded? After Queen Mary I's death, the crown passed to her younger half-sister. Talis provided music for Mary's funeral in 1558, and also for the coronation of her successor, Elizabeth I, in 1559. Elizabeth was a Protestant, albeit one who from the very start of her reign professed a desire to find a middle way in matters of faith. She did not want, it would be reported, to make windows into men's souls. Elizabeth did unmake her sister's return of England into loyalty with Rome. Elizabeth was to be the supreme governor of the church in England there was to be no papal authority over her. But, whether due to Elizabeth's personal preferences or perhaps to a desire to equivocate in regards to the character of faith for her nation, some of the aesthetics of the Roman Catholic religion, the vestments, the bells and smells, if you will, were permitted to return. In addition, some of the more pressing and indeed contentious issues such as the truth or otherwise of transubstantiation, would be couched in more ambiguous terms in Elizabeth's prayer book than they had been in the prayer book or prayer books issued during her brother's reign. And this gave worshippers more leeway. It let them interpret things as best suited their own beliefs. It is, I can see, appealing to try to position Thomas Tallis's compositions within certain periods to attempt to find ways to show that he was in fact creating with a particular faith brief in mind, one that depended on who was the monarch at the time, and this may of course have been what happened. His English version of the Te Deum was, after all, likely to have had a better reception in the reforming or reformed church, because that was the one that promoted an English Bible and an English prayer book. And maybe his Gaude Gloriosa de Marta, Latin for Rejoice, Mother of God, a composition that so honoured the Virgin Mary, that traditional focus of Roman Catholic supplication, was written during the reign of that Roman Catholic queen who had been named in her honour. Perhaps it was even composed at the time that that queen thought that she would soon become a mother herself. Was it meant to celebrate an arrival that would ultimately not appear? Now, I can certainly see how this is a compelling way to explore and indeed provide context for Thomas Tallis's work. Unfortunately, though, dating his work with anything approaching accuracy is hugely complex. As John Milsom explains, quote, no music books used by the Chapel Royal survive from Tallis's lifetime, and a large number of his works written for the choir have almost certainly been lost. The majority of his works that do survive are to be found, quote, only in Elizabethan manuscripts, copied by amateur collectors for their own use, and therefore can be dated only tentatively. What we can say is that Thomas Tallis managed to retain his place and prominence during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. However, with that being said, it does seem that he did encounter some financial difficulties during the 1570s, or at least he behaved as though he did. In 1573, Thomas Tallis and his colleague from the Chapel Royal, William Byrd, requested an increase in pay from their Queen. At the start of 1575, Tallis and Byrd were granted a 21-year monopoly over the printing of music and the importing of printed music. However, Only one book of music appears to have actually been printed under this licence. 
This book was published in 1575. It was a collection of Latin motets composed by Talis and Bird and dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I. By the summer of 1577, this pair were once again petitioning their Queen. They informed her that the licence on printing and importing of music, quote, hath fallen to our great loss and hindrance, to the value of 200 marks at least. Here they are claiming that maintaining this monopoly, which should have enriched them, was in fact impoverishing them. This petition led to Talis and Bird being granted leases of lands in reversion, which brought them a helpful injection of funds in the form of the rents that were payable on those lands. Thomas Tallis's career spanned four Tudor monarchs. It survived the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, and the return to the Protestant faith. But when it comes to his own faith, questions abound. During the Elizabethan period, Thomas Tallis does seem to have presented as an individual who, in a fairly uncomplicated fashion, followed the faith path of the Church of England during that time. However, some of his compositions from that same period, particularly when they are coupled with the company he kept and the patrons he may have sought, does present a different picture. For example, parts of the Roman Catholic liturgy did manage to find their way into his sacred songs when it was published in 1575. And when it comes to the creation of my own favourite Thomas Tallis work, Sperminalium, it is suggested that Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, a Roman Catholic, is the one that commissioned this piece in 1571. Meanwhile, another Roman Catholic noble, Henry Fitzalan, 12th Earl of Arundel, owned a copy of this same composition, and it was included in the inventory of his library that was made in 1596. It has even been suggested that the very first performance of Spare Minalium may have occurred at this Earl's London home of Arundel House. However, with that being said, there is another anecdote that holds that the piece was instead created to celebrate Queen Elizabeth I's 40th birthday, and that is why it was made for 40 voices. Thomas Tallis's connection to William Byrd is something that has already been detailed to a degree in this video. But in addition to their working relationship, there was clearly a strong personal one. Tallis was the godfather to Byrd's son, and he asked Byrd to be the witness to his will. And Byrd's faith appears to be more obviously Roman Catholic, because he would be cited for his recusancy in 1585. And not long after this, he began to produce overtly Roman Catholic liturgical music. 1585 was also the year that Thomas Tallis died, on the 23rd of November. He was survived by his friend Bird, who clearly mourned him deeply. In the aftermath of the death, Bird would write the following elegy for his friend, for five voices. Quote, Ye sacred muses, race of Jove, whom music's law delighteth, come down from crystal heavens above to earth where sorrow dwelleth. In mourning weeds, with tears in eyes, Talis is dead and music dies. Thomas Talis was also survived by his wife Joan whose own will, from a couple of years later, would leave a guilt bowl to Anthony Roper. He was a lawyer, who was named as being a Roman Catholic and also a recusant. He additionally happened to be the grandson of that famed Roman Catholic martyr, Sir or Saint Thomas More. So what do you think of Thomas Tallis, of his music, of his royal service and his court survival, of his true faith. As always, I am looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, but I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because the more engagement a video gets, which commenting does help with, the more that YouTube then will share that video out, which will in turn help to grow this community. As we've been talking about Talis, let's pick something musical emoji-wise. You choose 
and I look forward to seeing what you've picked. You can find me elsewhere on social media and I will leave links to all of the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please share it with your friends. In fact, if you like my channel, let some pals know about it. You can let me know that you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, have a little check now. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear so that YouTube will allegedly tell you when I've next uploaded. Of course, we do now have a fail safe as well. You can pop over to my website at www.katrinamarchant.com and you put your email in my mailing list box, then you'll be added to my mailing list and you will get a mail shot in advance to let you know when I am next going live, which I know you're not going to want to miss to talk about the history news, and also when I'm next uploading and what I'm uploading. So maybe that will be a good thing to do as YouTube can be a little bit hit and miss when it comes to notifications. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.